this thing on? Wonderful. So first of all, thank you everybody for coming. I know that this slot is very stiff um, competition. I, I consider it to not show up myself, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks for, for being here. I'm Hinek. Um, if you've ever encountered a Hinek in a Python community, it was probably me. If not, it was a cop. Don't talk to them, ask the lawyer. <laughs> so, other than that, um, I also maintain way too many open source projects. Um, most famously, Edders, which is the direct ancestor of the much beloved data classes, which at this point has more than 14 million downloads per month, which, by the way, is 2 million up since PyCon US, which is getting really scary, and is roughly 4x of Django, to just give you an idea. I also have still a few uh, stickers left, which I made last year. So if you want some of them, come to me. I have very few left. Uh, yesterday, you may have learned about Structlog from Google. Um, if I break it, in the best case scenario, PyPI CI breaks. In the worst case, you cannot download any packages anymore. <laughs> and all, all the rest of it also uh, keeps a lot of systems running to more or less degree. Um, but despite this anxiety and use it, inducing body of work, I'm not saying that I'm good at maintaining open source software. I'm also not saying that I'm happy at maintaining open source software. Actually, I tried uh, to thank all my projects and bring them to goodwill because they don't spark any joy anymore, but uh, for some reason, they prefer my Hugo Boss sweaters. So, um, yeah, the problem with that every open source maintainer at some point arrives is that is a lack of time. Because maybe you have crunch at work, maybe you want to travel, which is one of my main problems. Conference preparations. You should see my GitHub inbox leading up to EuroPython. It's a nightmare. <laughs> um, and sometimes you do have the time, but you don't, just don't have the energy, which is also normal. Like, uh, eventually, you don't have the first rushes of uh, starting an open source project, and it's just work. It's a drudge. But I'm not here to talk about how shitty it is maintain open source software. I think that's um, well established. And if you, if, <laughs> um, if not, you can Google it. There's a lot of uh, thought pieces on Medium. Um, I'm here to, tell, to teach you how to feel less shitty about it and how to be less stressed while shipping, and this is important, high quality Python package. And to achieve that, we need to talk about removing friction from the contribution process. Uh, I'm gonna talk mainly about your contributors because as a maintainer, once your project is running, your main job is to be a leader. So you're kind of a, the product manager, and this is your only specific task as a maintainer, right? You decide what goes into your project. You decide on the scope of your project. You are responsible to uphold the quality of what you are shipping. And um, the best way to burn out through bug tracker is to ship a bunch of uh, broken releases. And I've seen some really bad hostilities on bug trackers happen caused by the constant negativity that came in. And speaking of that, you also get to set the tone of your project. And I think this is the biggest upside. You can out kick out toxic people before they become a problem. In practice, you will still write code. Um, but your goal is that you set up your project in a way that anybody can write code for your project, even you after three months of Red Dead Redemption 2. So also, once your project matures, your development velocity goes down. This is natural. Like, you, you don't want to move from major projects fastly at some point. Uh, and you are not going to hack on it every day. Again, it's just fine. But once you come back, it's, it's the same like with, uh, I don't know if you've ever played some video game and came back after three months and you had no idea how, to con how the controls work. It's the same with projects. So you'll be grateful for everything that, that you put into place to hit the road running when you need to f fix a bug or some compatibility problems. So you're basically contributing to your own project. There are two separate roles here. And any friction for your contributors also falls back on you more or less directly. So the most obvious thing is work just doesn't get done. So how many of you ever wanted to fix something in a project you're using? You knew how to fix it, but you didn't do it because the process was unclear or overwhelming. Right, every arm just went up. <laughs> And this was a lot of arms, and I think some just, just too shy. You always have to like multiply by three. Um, 
stands for work that has not been done, or that has been done by the maintainer, although they could have used the time for something better. Also, if every new contributor needs hand-holding to get even started contributing, this is a menial task. We don't talk about it like this, but it is. Emotional labor is labor. Support labor is labor. And this kind of labor will burn you out much faster, at least in my experience, than uh, writing code, which is usually much kind of fun. So when a willing contributor arrives, you want them to have it very easy to get started and give them an early first feeling of success. Because motivation tends to evaporate really fast if you do not have buy-in with the project. So give them the dopamine really fast. You also want to give them a clear path from start to finish. Uh, because in my experience, people do not mind putting work and time into quality. They have an intrinsic interest in your package staying high quality, because if it breaks, they get paid at 3 a.m. in the morning. So this is not a problem, but they want to know what to do, and ideally want to know before they start the journey. And in my experience, and this is not just about open source or anything, a long, concrete to-do list with actionable items beats a vague, short one every day, and it feels better. You also want to give them a short feedback loop, which in this context means the time between you try something out and you know the result of that, like running tests or something like that. This is, to me, the number one factor in development ergonomics, and it encourages experimentation, which is good. And the lack of a fi good feedback loop is usually the number one reason for me to abandon work on some bug fix for some other project. So in the following, I'm going to show you how I try to remove friction from contributing to my projects. Um, and I to do that, I'm going to talk you through the life cycle of a contribution. And it's going to be a play in three acts featuring you, who wants to contribute to a project of mine, and me, who wants to, get into, wants to get your work into the project and out to the people with as little work as possible for myself. And ideally, this is like the bonus round, I want to bind you to the project to do even more free work for me. So. Um, Unfortunately, the small-minded organizers of this conference um, denied me my request for an all-day Hinek track. So <laughs> all we have is 45 minutes. There also will be no questions, but I'm around. Just come and talk to me. Um, even if I play with my phone, I usually do that because I'm too shy to talk to people. Um, I'm going to present concepts. And the concrete implementations I, will, I have collected on a page which uh, I will present at the end. And you can look up anything I will talk about there, and uh, there are concrete implementations or anything. I'm just making stuff up here. Everything I talk about has a real counterpart. So we start with your part. Uh, this is entirely about you. If I have to intervene at this stage, I have failed you because you've encountered friction, and myself because I want to be skateboarding somewhere and not derp on GitHub. So this would be a lose-lose. So where do we start? If you want to contribute, you need the source code, obviously. Now, sometimes I find it surprisingly hard to find it. And I've Googled for projects before to find it on GitHub. So what I do is that all my projects have a block like this in their GitHub readme, on PyPI, and in the documentation. And all those three places are cross-reference, which is other. So once you find my project in one place, you find all other places, too. Now, this is the important part, or one of the important parts. First, encouragement, and a link to our contribution guide, which at this point is also uh, a well-known file on GitHub called Contributing, RST, MD, whatever you uh, float your boat. And it gets linked prominently whenever try, someone tries to open a pull requests. And this file should encourage to follow through, because many still think that contributing to open source is some kind of elite thing only the enlightened can do, but turns out anybody can do it with some free time on their hands, which is a big privilege, which I will concede, but still there's like no, nothing you have to pass. So uh, just take a sentence to uh, dispel the notion and tell people they are always welcome to contribute. Describe the development process, the road I talked about. So people know what's ahead, so they know what they are getting into. Explain your expectations about your code standard, about your coverage expectation, the expectation of behavior. So, where you can reference another well-known file called Code of Conduct. 
I've said before, I think it's a huge privilege to be able to uh, maintain a good tone in a project. And finally, I help people to set up a local development environment for that quick feedback loop I've been harping around. And you will be surprised to learn that I have opinions on how to do that. So firstly, I use setup tools. I know there are alternatives. I know people have very strong opinions about alternatives and about setup tools. But none of those alternatives covers all my needs. And at this point, setup tools kind of works. So it's not that bad. Um, so for this false, I'm still on it. So first, you need to create a virtual environment however you prefer. There are great tools nowadays to manage them for you. You don't, really don't want to screw up your global installation to just run tests. And then you install uh, my package as editable, which means that uh, whenever the source code changes, the installed package automatically changes along with it. And we use an extra dependency called dev. So who is familiar with the syntax? OK. Who has learned about the syntax yesterday in Mark Smith's talk? <laughs> OK. <laughs> I will still explain it shortly. Uh, so again, these are optional dependencies. This is a really cool feature many people do not know about or don't use. And you can have multiple of them. You just separate them by commas, for example, URL3. You can use this exact syntax in your requirements TXT. And it's quite possible that your favorite project actually has features you didn't know about that are gated by optional dependencies. On the development side, it's quite easy. Uh, you just pass a dictionary into the setup tools uh, setup call. And this dictionary maps those uh, optional, uh, optional names to a list of dependencies. That's all. Now, setup.py is Python code. This is a dictionary, so it means you can also build your dictionary iteratively. It is exactly what I do. I first set it to uh, tests, which is something like this, docs, which is Sphinx, and then I have my dev environment I just talked about, which is just this plus docs. It's nice when you can write code. Now, now we can write uh, run tests, bless you. Um, we can also build documentation. So, and I really think that unless you have C extension or some really weird stuff that's not your fault, this is all it should take to run tests on your project. Now, we have two problems here, though. So first, you have to remember how to run your tests. Although I really think it should always be PyTest because tests are code. Ideally, you have more test code than package code because you have dynamic language, so you have to be careful. Code needs to be maintained. Um, Maintenance is not easier for tests. So I personally do not buy into this purity notion of tests. I think you should use the best tools available. But I still don't expect you to remember that, because why should you? So um, some people solve this using make files, especially people working in corporate environments that have a more homogeneous environment. Um, I don't think this is great especially because it's problematic on Windows. And as you may or may not know, the vast majority of Python programmers is on Windows. So if you make things hard for them, you are cutting off a significant portion of possible contributors. Um, also, you're testing only one Python version. I mean, it's almost 2020, so maybe you're lucky enough that you don't have to test against Python 2, but still we have a bunch of Python that are in active use. So what you could do is that you could start creating more virtual environment and manage them, or uh, you just use the tool that is made for this specifically that Mark Smith also talked about, and it's talks. Completely oversimplified, it allows you to declare virtual environments, optionally build your package and install it into that um, virtual environment, and then run any command out of this virtual environment. Uh, it's easiest explained with an example. You need a talks.ini in your project directory. First, you define the list of your environments. In this case, it's Python 2.7, 3.7, PyPy, and PyPy 3. So we have four environments in this case. Then you set global settings. In this case, we install our local package with the extra tests that I've just showed you. And we run PyTest. And, uh, PyTest. Now, if you add this uh, squiggly post arch thing at the end, you can even pass arguments to PyTest. So if you now run something like this, talks-e py27 dash 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 x, it will run PyTest dash x in the py27 environment. So technically, you don't even need a local test uh, development environment. You can get away with talks completely. Now, 
I consider it a valid, ex valid expectation for most Python projects that I just can run tests, uh, talks, and it tests everything against all versions. And I really think you should have good reasons for that to not be the case. Or you should use Nox, which is also quite nice. And it doesn't, it uses Python instead of this kind of hacky .ini um, file. And as we will see later, Tox is a lot more versatile than you might think. It's not just for running tests. Now, um, there's more to code quality than just tests. Uh, there are issues of style, like consistency, makes code much easier to read. Pep8 comes to mind. Some, some things are not wrong, but unfortunate. For example, unused imports or unused variables, which by them itself are harmless, but they may actually be problematic because maybe you are using the wrong, wrong variable. And the process of checking code without running it is, of course, called lint ink. The name is based on the stuff that you find in your pockets, like pocket lint or in your belly buttons. Uh, they are nothing, it's nothing terrible, but uh, your life is usually better with, without some shit in your belly button. So it's better to get rid of it. So uh, the most famous linter for Python, of course, Flake 8. And it, it actually just combines multiple tools, like PEP8 for style, PyFlakes for correctness. And I'm going to go out on a limb and claim that code that passes Flake 8 is more correct and more readable. Now, what is the single commit every Python project has that uses setup tools? <coughs> yes, I hear the laughter of pain. <laughs> so this loser obviously just forgot to run his linters because there is a linter and it's called check manifest, easy to remember. And finally, have you ever seen a PyPI page like this? So this means that PyPI was not able to render your long description, and it means that you probably have some, uh, some typos somewhere in a, in a markup or something. So I'm using this with permission, and also if you look closely, this is the test PyPI instance, which some people are not quite aware of, I think. And this is really cool when you're starting out and uh, a good place to upload your empty source directories and broken wheels before you go uh, on the real thing. It gets erased every, every now and then, so it's completely harmless and you, it has separate credentials, so you have to create an, another account and it's pretty cool. So there's a linter for this, it's called Twine, which is also the tool you will use to upload your package, but it also is able to catch this for you. Now, Linting and checking is great, like robots yelling at you is always better than people yelling at you, but what's even better? Making a stupid computer you paid so much money for fix these things actually for you. And this is about automatic formatters. And they got more popular in the past years, and in my opinion they are an immense game changer. Because once you embrace them, it means that you and your contributors can stop uh, thinking, and most notably bickering about minutia in your projects and you can focus on solving the problem you're trying to solve, and not when to hit enter or what kind of quotes to use or whatever. And there's been a bunch of formatters for Python for quite a while, but none of them was really quite there, at least not for me, until Black appeared. And Black has many great properties. So first of all, it uses a format I like because I yelled at Lukas a lot on Twitter. Um, but also, it formats it into a canonical format that is deterministic. So if you throw the semantically identic, uh, identical code into it, you will always get the same output out of it. And this is really nice. This is, for example, much better than Go format, which is not deterministic and drives me crazy every single time I use it. So then there's iSort. It will sort your imports, which I personally find more important than it should, into beautiful sorted blocks separated by type. So you've got your standard library, third party, your imports. It's wonderful. And together with black, this is like the most uh, code formatting that you will ever have to think about, and it's fully automated. You just don't have to think about it. You don't have to talk about it. It's great. It cannot come up in code review. It's no friction whatsoever. But how do you make the user run it now? Because um, we've got these linters, these checkers, those tests, these formatters. So for the linting part, some of them you have to, um, some of them imply packaging, most notably check manifests. So you have to run it in a proper tox environment so it, it can test the packaging part. But for everything else, there's something better, and it's called pre-commit. Pre-commit allows you to define hooks that run before each git commit. 
So it will prevent you for, uh, to even commit broken code. Um, but it also allows you to run it over the whole file. So it's kind of like a linter central, if you want. And to use it, you, can, you just need a config file in your repository called dot precommit config yaml. The A is not optional and it drives me bonkers because it's the only YAML file in, on my hard drive. <laughs> so anyhow, Flag8 has direct support because the, uh, the author of pre uh, and the maintainer of pre-commit is also now one of the maintainers of Flag8. So you have first class support. It's very really straightforward, just point it at a repo. You, you pick a version tag, which also ensures that the Flag8 update does not break your build. I think this is a good compromise because some projects like to pin all the development uh, dependencies. I personally am not a fan of that because um, once the velocity goes down, those projects tend to have like a weekly uh, update all our dependencies commit and the actual work gets kind of lost in the noise. So um, I think this is, this is kind of nice. Um, so you put in a version, you choose the hook and the Python version you want this hook to run, that's all. Now, the pre-commit is Python aware, so it will uh, store and manage your, the virtual environments that are required to run this tool. Completely transparently, it did not break for me yet, which is high praise for a, for a project that uh, deals with Python packaging. So uh, Black and iSort are also super simple, and there is a whole ecosystem around it. So uh, who's ever checked in a pdb.setTrace? Yeah. I think in this case, I don't have to multiply by three, but more like by five. <laughs> Liars. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> there is a hook for us. We don't have to do that anymore. And it's also not Python specific. So uh, the, the most far out thing that you do, it, you can run Docker containers as hooks. So like there's a kick. You, you can go all out. Now, with all this in place, I could ask you to install pre-commit. But pre-commit is a Python package. And it's asking you to install Python packages globally is um, it's just asking to turn my bug tracker into a Python packaging support forum. And this is not a good thing. Let me tell you that. I had this problem before. So let's wrap it into a dev extra. So this is basically what I do. Um, um, my development environment is basically the test extra plus the docs, docs extra plus pre-commit. So once you can run PyTest and build docs, you can also run pre-commit and your, your global system is left alone. So uh, to ensure that you run it, again, you should run pre-commit install so it gets installed as a git hook. Or you should run it by yourself. Again, I don't want you to remember that. So um, what we we're gonna do is that we will rely on tox again. We add one environment called lint. We um, have only one dependency, pre-commit itself. We will skip installation, and this is, uh, means that it's much, much faster. So whenever you run any commands from tox that do not need your package to be installed, always set skip install, because it's, it's much faster. Uh, and then we just run it against all files. And if one of the pre-commit hooks fails, this tox environment will fail too. You know something is broken. So, which means your code is perfect. What is missing? Documentation. How we make, do we make sure uh, that it builds? And you guessed it, if it's things you should, uh, which you should use, it's great. Um, it's another tox environment. So this time we install our extras docs, which I talked before too. It's usually just things and whatever I need to build my documentation. First, we will make sure that our HTML documentation builds. And then uh, we run the doc test for all documentation. And I'm gonna use this lectern to preach that all your examples in your documentation should be doc tests. Because then you can be sure that your examples are correct. Because nothing is worse than broken examples. Like even no examples is better than broken. I've spent hours of my programmer life just trying to figure out what I'm doing wrong and in the end this was just some comma missing in an example or a wrong keyword argument or whatever. So make sure examples are correct. Consequently if your uh, readme has doc tests 
check it too. So now, whenever you run talks, so basically typing three characters, you ensure that your tests are passing, that your linters are passing, that your code and imports are beautiful, uh, your documentation is building, and you have working examples. So this is the only thing I expect you to remember, TOX. And everything we've done so far happens on your local machine. I may not even know that you exist and you may have the perfect pull request for me, which is kind of cool. You can work anywhere. And I travel a lot. And sometimes I long for conference Wi-Fi, which is a bit unfair. The Wi-Fi here is really good. So. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Anybody who has been in Florence. <laughs> oh, yeah, a few of you were, right? <laughs> um, so... Um, especially like everybody who has ever used GitHub, let's say in rural Africa, will understand what I mean. Like the current internet, like the modern internet is completely broken for the largest part of the world and nobody of those who are responsible care because they have their go uh, cozy Google Fiber at home and at work. But um, this is not just about my laziness or the consequences of colonialism, it's also about my insecurity uh, and empathy because I don't like to publish unfinished work. I'm self-conscious like that. So I don't want to force you to publish half-finished work and then yell at you what you've done wrong. So I want to give you the tools to ensure a high-quality initial pull request. And then we can just talk about little stuff. Um, so now you're done. You open a pull request. And if you look at your watch, we spend most time in Act 1. Uh, and like I told you, I want to get involved as, as late as possible. Ideally, at this point, I'm still not there. So, uh, you want to automate as much as possible, but some things cannot be automated. So enter another well-known file. This one is called pull request template. It's always MD because it gets inserted whenever you open a pull request. And you can use it to uh, add like checklists to new pull requests. And I love checklists because they are the sole reason why airplanes do not crash every day and why doctors wash their hands before cutting you open. So they are like programs for humans. So it's just like the next best thing like, than uh, programs for computers. And rendered, they look something like this. And you can use it to remind people to add documentation for the new features, add version tags, as, uh, add change log entries. It's great. And now me, or ideally a co-maintainer, has to verify that you, the contributor, have done all these things. So this checklist is also for me, because I don't carry this list in my head. I can barely remember what I had for dinner yesterday. Oh wait, I do, I had nothing, because I cannot afford the food in the city. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm living off chocolate and coffee. <laughs> and I brought my own coffee. <laughs> Anyhow. While reviewing, I'm gonna, I refer to this list. Um, but I don't want to clone every of your pull requests to my computer to run the test and check everything. I'm, I'm lazy. So I also want to encourage contributions through the web interface. And it's something I came to appreciate myself a lot too. Because it's even less friction. And it's perfect for typos. I love typo pull requests. And I hate typos in my documentation. They are embarrassing, but nobody uh, fixes them. Or few, because they have to fork. My project, you have to check it out, you have to uh, do the change, you have to push it, um, open a pull request. That's a lot to ask for people to just swap two characters or uh, fix some grammar. So what we want is uh, the ability to run the tests on the internet. And it's of course called continuous integration or CI. And I don't know how many of you remember the dark ages of open source when only the most prestigious projects had their own CIs. Because in the best case scenario, someone donated you a server, usually Rackspace, and you had to run it yourself. I don't know if anyone is in open source to be a system operator, but I'm not. And this is very, uh, very unglamorous. So then came Travis. Travis has these ups and downs over years, but it arguably democratized the continuous integration scene in open source. And adding it to your project was really, really simple. You just copy and paste a bunch of YAML. It's like setup.py. And um, you can just reuse your tox environments so you made sure that the same command lines are run locally and in Travis. It was great for the good old times of 2018. 
However, then came Idera. And I'm not gonna comment on them specifically because I don't want to get sued by them. I'm going to encourage you to do your own research, to talk to people working at Travis or used to work at Travis. But here's a fact. They laid off the big part of the workforce sh shortly after taking over Travis. And that made what was supposed to be one slide telling you to use Travis and maybe app there if you need uh, Windows binaries, an unexpected research project. And it's a research project that did not go great, to be honest. Because every other option is way more complex than Travis or is lacking in some other way. Uh, but I consider Travis, or at least its free offerings, a time bomb at this point, and we need to make plans what to do afterwards. Which is sad, because uh, the importance of Travis to the community cannot be understated. And they raised the bar of open source significantly, but we don't know how this will shake out, and it's scary. So the good part is probably it's an end of a monoculture. Um, we used to have just Travis and maybe something else. Now people have to go a bit further. Uh, uh, Microsoft, smelling blood, the uh, <laughs> Azure pipelines has been, uh, has been advertised a lot, especially at PyCon US. They offered help with moving your project from Travis to Azure pipelines. But then they managed to break their pre-installed pythons for 24 days. And I don't know, like Travis never had an audit like this. Like, this, this was very embarrassing, uh, especially because I published a blog post on how to move to Travis like a day before. So people started emailing me. Um, anyhow, it's working now. Uh, they wrote a very long uh, post-mortem and promised to do better, but here we are. It's like nothing great is there. Like everything has problems. So let's hope that next year everything's gonna be great. One thing that's almost forgotten nowadays is that GitHub was, was or is actually working on a CI2 called GitHub Actions. But it has been in private beta forever now. I've been waiting for months to get access. and I have no idea when it's gonna be ready and who knows if it ever goes public. Now they've been taken over by Microsoft, there's not much interest, I guess, I don't know. But GitHub already provides a bunch of automation. So first, the most obvious one is GitHub Checks, which allows third party services to put a green check mark or a red X next to your pull requests if you've done something wrong. Most common usages are, of course, CI integration. Also common thing is to use services like coveralls or uh, CodeCov to fail your pull request if you don't have enough code coverage. But there's a more sophisticated approach, or more artisanal, if you will, which are GitHub bots. And Mariata, the Kalesi of CPython core development bots, get a bunch of talks and webinars on that. And I think this is important because she changed core development forever. Back when I was a lot more active than nowadays, a lot of the day-to-day -day work as a core developer means, meant downloading patches from uh, Roundup, applying them, trying something out, uh, backporting stuff between branches, and so on. Uh, you spent a lot of busy work. And all this work has been completely eliminated by bots nowadays. Now, I've been told that there's also an open space today uh, at 11.20, which is right after this talk. I'm sorry, Max. Uh, so if you're interested into this kind of stuff, this might be for you. But um, that's all I'm gonna say about the mechanical parts of the pull request process. Now, what happens after all the checks are passing? Someone has to review it. In the beginning, it's probably you. As the project grows, you don't want to review everything yourself. You literally can't review everything yourself. You also don't want to try edge all bugs, answer all questions. There's a natural limit to how much you can do, especially if that limit is your free time. So you need to build a community. And building communities is hard. And there's lots of material on the net. I don't have much new to add. But there's one thing that's important to me that I want to talk about, and that's about community empowerment. I find it important given the history I've been watching in the Python community, that you give your, um, give your contributors the, pr the feeling that the project is theirs too. And I'm gonna note that I wrote this talk way before the latest uh, Python community drama. And it was a problem back there too. It just hadn't been talked about it a lot. And the problem is that it's very shitty to let others do the work to build your brand for nothing in return. Contributors should be celebrated. 
And taking all the fame for yourself may feel great in a short term, and uh, you get to retweet all the praise about you and your project and how awesome you are, but it will backfire eventually. People will burn out for not feeling valued. I've seen people get very resentful. I've seen people write blog posts. <laughs> uh, so this is the thing. Uh, for this reason, once adders grew, grew beyond a certain size, and a lot of the code was from other contributors, it's most notably typing. I, it has been written by a bunch of people from mostly Dropbox, some of them from Pilot. And I've, I honestly do not understand all of it yet. And I have like three contributors to review those, those PRs. And I felt bad to make it look like it's all my work, because it wasn't. And there was still my name on the GitHub. And also practical reasons, because there's a bunch of functionality missing from personal projects versus um, organizational projects. So I moved Adders into a GitHub organization. And anyone who contributed to the project can have full access. Now it's our project. And if it's less obvious that the project is yours, people are also less likely to add you, telling you that um, your free labor is ruining their lives. So upsides all around. So how do you decide whom to take in into your project, whom you give commit rights? I, what I've learned is that you should not make a big deal out of it for the most types of projects. If someone wants commit rights, just give them to them. And I learned this very zen approach from my friend Corey Benfield, who did amazing work on a Python HTTP stack uh, before we tragically lost him to a fruit company. And PyPy does the same thing. So uh, I see, saw a lot of PyPy people around, so you can talk to them. <laughs> And there is nothing people can do in Git or Mercurial that can't be reverted if you just protect your master branch and force everyone through pull requests. And if the process is clear, people usually will adhere to it. And if not, you revert their changes, you, re uh, you take away their rights. It's that easy. But it never happened to me or Corey or PyPy. People tend to respect code. This is like the only value we seem to be shared. We because it's much more likely that you have to kick off people uh, from mailing lists uh, because they don't respect other people as much as they do code. So it's, it's kind of sad, but here we are. So finally, providing support can also be very stressful, especially on synchronous channels like IRC or God forbid Slack. So I started moving support to Stack Overflow. Uh, this has multiple advantages. So first of all, it's asynchronous. So many of us are Europeans, so we know this problem that a lot of our open source uh, friends are in a very different time zone. So if people from San Francisco ask something, I don't have to be awake to answer. And maybe I have the chance that someone else answers before I get awake and see it. Um, it's searchable. So if I answer one question once, the answer does not vanish in some obscure archive, it's there. And the deduplication de of questions is not my problem, but a problem of Stack Overflow moderators, which is great. Um, and if I have to answer in the end, at least I get internet brownie points out of it in a form of uh, Stack Overflow uh, reputation. So, uh, but I still don't want to hang around on the page all day. So what I do is that I set up tags for my projects, and then I follow them on RSS. And yes, RSS, you may have heard grandma talk fondly about that. <laughs> just, ima just imagine Instagram, but there's no stories, no photos, and you can choose your own client. It's great. There's a downside. Uh, not everyone can set up tags. You need a certain amount of reputation. I think it's like 1,500 points. So don't ask me. I don't have that much reputation. People don't ask that many address questions. I'm barely over 1,000, but there are many people in the Python community who can help you out there. So back to our pull request. Let's assume I reviewed it. While doing so, I didn't have to pester you about the line length, the import order, the type of quotes, the trailing, about trailing commas, missing trailing commas, failing tests, broken documentation. And nothing of that I just enumerated is made up. I've pestered people about it before. Because I have strong standards for my, for my uh, projects that I'm not willing to bulge on. But I'm willing to do everything to make them go away. And in this case, robots got to be the assholes. 
And studies have shown that people will take pestering from a robot much less personally than from other people. Because the robot is, is not, unless it's some AI thing that has been uh, trained with racist data, but a uh, robot usually is, um, they just look at your code and see the problems that you told them to detect. And who doesn't lo love an asshole robot? So. <laughs> so now we merge it. Then as a maintainer, I would like to encourage you to say thank you. I've been doing this for many years, but I still find commentless merges super rude. Like, I don't know, I just feel bad. I've spent some time to fix a bug. You probably are grateful, just express it. Like, speak your heart. Now, for everyone to use your great contribution, it's time for the third and final act, the release. And what I hope you realize is that you've, if you followed act one and two, you can release at any time. Uh, because your pull request based workflow with a CI that makes sure uh, that it's, everything is green ensured the master branch can be released anytime. And it is not only convenient, this can be essential if you have an emergency like a nasty bug or a security problem. So um, the problem is if your project is ready to be released at any time, but you don't because the release process is a drag and you procrastinate on it, it's kind of worthless. And it leads to bug reports like, oh my god, the last release is so long ago, is this even maintained? <laughs> I'm sure you've seen something like that before. You don't want that. What you want is to fully automate. And if you look at it, releasing a package to PyPI, it's just a matter of replacing, replacing a bunch of strings, running a bunch of commands, and double checking a bunch of outputs. That's all. That's, that's no rocket science here. You just have to, to, to pick whether you want to let the CI do your releases, which is increasingly popular, and the amazing hypothesis project takes us to 11 um, by just pushing a new release for every pull request they merge. So they have a lot of releases, and I believe uh, my friend Justin Meyer, who's sitting here, uh, will talk about something like this on Friday, how you can have that, so check this out. Um, I personally am not a big fan of that because I'm a control freak, so I prefer local automation. Uh, because I just have, like to have more interactive control and like to centralize my tools. This is the more important part for me because I maintain multiple projects and projects tend to multiply once you embrace the glamorous open source lifestyle. So you want to avoid duplication of code and knowledge. So what I do is that I rely on conventions and those are conventions I can enforce because I'm in control of my project. That's the big benefit of being a maintainer. And because I can rely on conventions, I only need one release script for all of my projects. Um, one of my conventions is how I handle metadata. Oh, I forgot to click. How I handle metadata. So all projects of mine have this block um, in the main dunder in it. Most of this is our Python conventions, but this one is mine. So what I like to do is that uh, I, my packages in development always have the next version with a dev zero suffix to make clear it's not the last version anymore, and it's not the next version yet. So it's not ambiguous about this one. And when I release, I just have to strip that suffix and my code is ready. All I have to do is, uh, no wait, one more thing. This is the canonical data of my project, and I really like that to make the code the canonical thing, and everything else derives from that. So my setup.py derives from that, just parses it using regular expressions. My conf.py in the documentation reads this file. This is really nice. And if you are using alternative uh, packaging tools like Flit or Poetry, uh, you will have to do more work uh, than that. Um, so what, what else do you need? You need a change log. Um, so in my case, it's just I have to release uh, replace a string called unreleased with the current date, and that's it. Um, technically, our project is ready for release. The version is correct, changelog is ready. Let's ship it. Now, shipping the project itself is a few simple steps. Uh, I wrote a blog post about it. Mark Smith talked about it yesterday. You just commit your changes we just talked about, take your version, build a package, push it to PyPI, it's done. Your contribution is there, and everybody in this room can uh, automate everything I just talked about. It's like no rocket science whatsoever. And even if it seems trivial, uh, paper cuts will vary you down to two. Okay, uh, I'm already being waved at myself with, uh, with the time. I have one minute, though. Um, there's so much more I'd like to talk about, how to handle coverage, for example, local and CI. 
managing change logs using tools like Town Crier. If you have a lot of merge uh, problems, that's something for you. I had to kill 20 slides about documentation and uh, it, my eternal love for read the docs and uh, Eric. And an entire rant about 79 characters being the only true line length. Um, I had an essay on how to prevent packaging mishaps like empty source distributions on PyPI use a sources directory, and I had a whole TED talk about semantic versioning being well-intentioned, ultimately fundamentally flawed. But eh, I'm already being <laughs> waived that, so I hope everyone got something from that. Um, I already made my uh, plot twist on Twitter, so it's all, everything I said is also relevant if it is your job. You automate, document, have a short feedback loop, um, that's all I have for you. This is the link I talked about. Get everything I talked about there. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Get your domains from Varamedia if you speak German. Schweizer Deutsch works too. Uh, I'm Hinek. Thank you very much. <laughs>